Hello, everyone, Hello. and welcome Hi. to Travel Unpacked. I'm Josh, and this is a podcast for all things travel, from destination deep dives to stories from fellow travelers and behind-the-scenes insights from the Colette team. Travel Unpacked is your hottest ticket to the world, and today we've got a treat in store for you listeners. We are excited to bring our very first Travel Trivia Unpacked. How excited are we, ladies? I'm so excited. I never get to play trivia because you guys are so competitive. I'm usually the host. I'm excited, too. I'm excited to see how you do, Nicole, if you stack up against me and Josh. Well, Nicole, we're excited because you are finally back from Costa Rica. How was Costa Rica? Was it everything that you dreamed it would be for the last 30 years? It was great. It was beautiful. It really felt like paradise. I went in the rainy season or what they call the rainy season. And aside from getting caught in a torrential downpour in the Monte Verde Cloud Reserve on a nature hike, it really didn't impact our trip too much. So it was so beautiful. I ziplined. We saw so many wild animals and so many birds and it was so lush and green and beautiful. And what I didn't know about the zip lining was there were 13 courses. Like mm -hmm. it just felt like at the beginning you were getting off one. They were quickly roping you onto the other. Were you in your coffee heaven? Like did mm -hmm. you have all the coffee? I had all the coffee and sometimes I would make it into iced coffee just to, you know, demand that a little bit. It was so fun. That was day one, the Doka coffee plantation. We got to see the whole process of how coffee is made and how important it is to the economy there and to the locals. Well, Nicole, we are so excited that you are back with us, especially for this great new day of trivia. So let's get ready to test our travel knowledge and have some fun as we dive into fascinating facts and quirky tidbits from around the world. We have three exciting rounds lined up for our listeners, each one designed to challenge and entertain. So play along with us at home. See if you can beat all of us to the punch with the correct answers. And remember, this is just the beginning. There's more trivia episodes on the way. So stay tuned. And it shouldn't just be from us. We want to hear from you. If you have any great trivia questions or topics or interesting travel facts that you'd like us to include in future episodes, send them our way. Email us at travelunpacked at colette.com and share your travel-related trivia questions or topics. Again, that's travelunpacked at colette.com. We'll put the link in the notes for you as well. All right. So without further ado, <laughs> let's get to our first game. Is everybody ready? We 100% ready. are ready. Well, welcome to our first segment called <laughs> Around the World in Five Sounds. I love this game because here's the thing. A lot of times when we think of travel, it's, of course, visual. We're either looking at a brochure, we're looking at photos of a place, picturing a lion on the African savanna, or the Eiffel Tower, or maybe it's taste and smell, like dipping fresh bread in olive oil, the spice markets of Morocco. But there's a whole other sensory way to travel, and that is by ear. There are so many places in the world that have sounds that are totally iconic and tied to that location. A single sound can transport you to a bustling market, a serene temple, maybe a celebration halfway across the globe. And this game is all about that. So here's how it's going to work. Ladies, I'm going to play a sound from a unique location from around the globe. Each of you and our players at home will take a turn guessing what the sound is and where it's from. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to reveal the answer and keep score as we go. One point for each correct answer. So ready to test your auditory travel skills? I'm a little nervous. Because here is sound number one. All right, Kelsey, we're going to start with you. What do you think that sound was? So during the Costa Rica episode, I said monkey, but I should have said howler monkey. And I want to say church bells, but I feel like you're looking for something a little bit more in it. So it's, I'm going to say church bells at the Vatican. And I'm going to say church bells at Westminster Abbey. And I'm going to say you are both wrong. That was actually Big Ben Chimes <laughs> in London, England. I was in the right country. I was in the right city. Does that count? Unfortunately. I mean... She was I got in the wrong country. Churches. She was in a place where they speak a completely different language. 
There are no half points, but here's some fun facts. The chimes of Bing Ben have been marking time in London since 1859. The clock tower, officially named Elizabeth Tower, is one of the most iconic landmarks in London. And the sound of Big Ben's chimes have been broadcast by the BBC since 1923, making it familiar to people around the world. Here's a little extra point. Which of our tours visit Big Ben? A uh, spotlight on London. Spotlight on London. London and Paris. English. <laughs> England. Shade to the English countryside. So you're just you're just yelling out words, but yes, it is spotlight <laughs> on London. Shades of the English countryside <laughs> and British landscapes. I think. Okay, maybe we each get a point. <laughs> <laughs> All right, are we ready for sound number two? Because here we go. Hello, everyone, Hello. and welcome Hi. to Travel Unpacked. I'm Josh, and this is a podcast for all things travel, from destination deep dives to stories from fellow travelers and behind-the-scenes insights from the Colette team. Travel Unpacked is your hottest ticket to the world. And today, we've got a treat in store for you listeners. We are excited to bring our very first Travel Trivia Unpacked. How excited are we, ladies? I'm so excited. I never get to play trivia because you guys are so competitive. I'm usually the host. I'm excited, too. I'm excited to see how you do, Nicole, if you stack up against me and Josh. Well, Nicole, we're excited because you are finally back from Costa Rica. How was Costa Rica? Was it everything that you dreamed it would be for the last 30 years? It was great. It was beautiful. It really felt like paradise. I went in the rainy season or what they call the rainy season. And aside from getting caught in a torrential downpour in the Monte Verde Cloud Reserve on a nature hike, it really didn't impact our trip too much. So it was so beautiful. I ziplined. We saw so many wild animals and so many birds and it was so lush and green and beautiful. And what I didn't know about the zip lining was there were 13 courses. Like, it mm -hmm. just felt like at the beginning, you were getting off one, they were quickly roping you onto the other. Were you in your coffee heaven? Like, did mm -hmm. you have all the coffee? I had all the coffee. And sometimes I would make it into iced coffee just to, you know, demand that a little bit. It was so fun. That was day one, the Doka coffee plantation. We got to see the whole process of how coffee is made and how important it is to the economy there and to the locals. Well, Nicole, we are so excited that you are back with us, especially for this great new day of trivia. So let's get ready to test our travel knowledge and have some fun as we dive into fascinating facts and quirky tidbits from around the world. We have three exciting rounds lined up for our listeners, each one designed to challenge and entertain. So play along with us at home. See if you can beat all of us to the punch with the correct answers. And remember, this is just the beginning. There's more trivia episodes on the way. So stay tuned. And it shouldn't just be from us. We want to hear from you. If you have any great trivia questions or topics or interesting travel facts that you'd like us to include in future episodes, send them our way. Email us at travelunpacked at colette.com and share your travel-related trivia questions or topics. Again, that's travelunpacked at colette.com. We'll put the link in the notes for you as well. All right. So without further ado, <laughs> let's get to our first game. Is everybody ready? We 100% ready. are ready. Well, welcome to our first segment called <laughs> Around the World in Five Sounds. I love this game because here's the thing. A lot of times when we think of travel, it's, of course, visual. We're either looking at a brochure, we're looking at photos of a place, picturing a lion on the African savanna, or the Eiffel Tower, or maybe it's taste and smell, like dipping fresh bread in olive oil, the spice markets of Morocco. But there's a whole other sensory way to travel, and that is by ear. There are so many places in the world that have sounds that are totally iconic and tied to that location. A single sound can transport you to a bustle market, a serene temple, maybe a celebration halfway across the globe. And this game is all about that. So here's how it's going to work. Ladies, I'm going to play a sound from a unique location from around the globe. Each of you and our players at home will take a turn guessing what the sound is and where it's from. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to reveal the answer and keep score as we go. One point for each correct answer. So ready to test your auditory travel skills? Mm -hmm. I'm a little nervous. Because here is sound number one. Mm -hmm. 
All right, because we started with Kelsey first last time, we're going to start with Nicole this time. Nicole, what do you think sound number two is? I think it's the sound that my house makes after dinner. Did somebody <laughs> come here and record that themselves? I don't <clears throat> know. All right, Kelsey, I think you know what it is. I saw how excited you were. It's the haka dance, and it can be seen in New Zealand. It is the haka chant in New Zealand, and the haka is a traditional Maori war dance that involves vigorous movements, chanting, and rhythmic stomping. It is performed by New Zealand's national rugby team, the All Blacks, before matches to intimidate opponents and honor their Maori heritage. And it's also performed at Nicole's house after dinner, I guess. So the haka was, has become a symbol of New Zealand's cultural identity. In our tours in New Zealand, there are many cultural immersions with the Maori people. In fact, on Australia's outback to New Zealand's South Island, our travelers take a canoe ride in a traditional waka canoe, which is where the haka in this clip was actually from. I love the haka. It brings oh, out so, so many great. like emotions when you watch it. Like you get chills. I went to New Zealand in 2005, a long time ago. Absolutely love it. And obviously I need to go back. I saw it too when yeah. I was there in 2013. Are we all ready oh. for sound number three? Let's yes. cue it up. All right, so we're going to go head over to Kelsey. Kelsey, name that sound. Uh, that is the sound of dinner entertainment in Italy. Nicole, can you top that? That is the sound of an opera performance in Tuscany. Well, I love the fact that you both are in Italy, but you are both wrong. That is a gondolier singing. Oh, it is. The gondoliers in Venice are known for serenading passengers with traditional Italian songs as they navigate the city's canals. And this tradition dates back centuries and adds a romantic and cultural touch to Venice experiences. Songs often include classics like O Sol Mio and Santa Lucia. Will you sing me one? If I knew how those went, those classics, um, I would sing them. <laughs> my first guided tour, I went with my school and we went to Italy and we did a gondola ride. And we said, sing to us, sing to us. And he said, tomorrow, tomorrow, because he knew we weren't going to oh, be there. That's... So that trivia question, that's some pain for me. I'm... Well, you got a point mm -hmm. for sound number two, but not for sound number three. <laughs> also, that guy was singing opera, and I said opera. It's the right type of music. Well, I said entertainment, and the people were entertained. He also said dinner, but you're not eating dinner on the gondola. <laughs> All right, well, here we go. We are going to queue up sound number four. said trivia was easy. Sometimes you have to dig a little bit deeper to find those sounds. So Nicole, we're going to start with you. What sound was sound number four? I think it was a drum performance by the Maasai in Africa. I love that. Kelsey? I'm going to go with a Native American drum experience in South Dakota. Ooh, South Dakota. So we have South Dakota and then we have Africa, but it is actually Nawa music in Morocco. And Nawa music is rich tradition that combines African, Arabic influences originating from the Nawa people who were brought to Morocco as slaves from West Africa. And this music is characterized by rhythmic drumming, call and response singing, and the use of three-stringed lute called the guambri. The Colors of Morocco tour includes a visit to the Nawa community. So you get to see and enjoy that musical performance. And you also stay in a luxurious tented camp in the Sahara which is truly one of a kind. All right, we are on our final sound. And right now, Kelsey has one point because she got the haka music. This was a lot harder than I thought. I thought maybe you ladies would have, you know, gravitated towards some of them. You know, Nicole, you, you've been to London. I figured you knew the big was... Ben chimes. Okay. And... okay, listen, I have half points all over the place. We're at least tied or I might be winning. <laughs> but play by your rules, Josh. Gotta be correct. One point for the actual trivia, half points for Nicole's fantasy land. So let's go to sound number five. Hello, everyone, Hello. and welcome Hi. to Travel Unpacked. I'm Josh, and this is a podcast for all things travel, from destination deep dives to stories from fellow travelers and behind-the-scenes insights from the Colette team. 
Travel Unpacked is your hottest ticket to the world. And today, we've got a treat in store for you listeners. We are excited to bring our very first Travel Trivia Unpacked. How excited are we, ladies? I'm so excited. I never get to play trivia because you guys are so competitive. I'm usually the host. I'm excited, too. I'm excited to see how you do, Nicole, if you stack up against me and Josh. Well, Nicole, we're excited because you are finally back from Costa Rica. How was Costa Rica? Was it everything that you dreamed it would be for the last 30 years? It was great. It was beautiful. It really felt like paradise. I went in the rainy season or what they call the rainy season. And aside from getting caught in a torrential downpour in the Monte Verde Cloud Reserve on a nature hike, it really didn't impact our trip too much. So it was so beautiful. I ziplined. We saw so many wild animals and so many birds and it was so lush and green and beautiful. And what I didn't know about the zip lining was there were 13 courses. Like mm-hmm. it just felt like at the beginning you were getting off one. They were quickly roping you onto the other. Were you in your coffee heaven? Like did mm-hmm. you have all the coffee? I had all the coffee and sometimes I would make it into iced coffee just to, you know, demand that a little bit. It was so fun. That was day one, the Doka coffee plantation. We got to see the whole process of how coffee is made and how important it is to the economy there and to the locals. Well, Nicole, we are so excited that you are back with us, especially for this great new day of trivia. So let's get ready to test our travel knowledge and have some fun as we dive into fascinating facts and quirky tidbits from around the world. We have three exciting rounds lined up for our listeners, each one designed to challenge and entertain. So play along with us at home. See if you can beat all of us to the punch with the correct answers. And remember, this is just the beginning. There's more trivia episodes on the way. So stay tuned. And it shouldn't just be from us. We want to hear from you. If you have any great trivia questions or topics or interesting travel facts that you'd like us to include in future episodes, send them our way. Email us at travelunpacked at colette.com and share your travel-related trivia questions or topics. Again, that's travelunpacked at colette.com. We'll put the link in the notes for you as well. All right. So without further ado, let's get to our first game. Is everybody ready? We 100% ready. are ready. Well, welcome to our first segment called (laughs) Around the World in Five Sounds. I love this game because here's the thing. A lot of times when we think of travel, it's, of course, visual. We're either looking at a brochure, we're looking at photos of a place, picturing a lion on the African savanna, or the Eiffel Tower, or maybe it's taste and smell, like dipping fresh bread in olive oil, the spice markets of Morocco. But there's a whole other sensory way to travel, and that is by ear. There are so many places in the world that have sounds that are totally iconic and tied to that location. A single sound can transport you to a bustling market, a serene temple, maybe a celebration halfway across the globe. And this game is all about that. So here's how it's going to work. Ladies, I'm going to play a sound from a unique location from around the globe. Each of you and our players at home will take a turn guessing what the sound is and where it's from. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to reveal the answer and keep score as we go. One point for each correct answer. So ready to test your auditory travel skills? I'm a little nervous. Because here is sound number one. These are impossible. Josh, did you pick these sounds? I want to play this game again next time, but I want to pick the sounds. This is great because this is a learning experience for you and for our listeners. Oh, I'm going to learn to walk around the world with my eyes closed. See, you got to work on this sense. So right now we're going to hear from Kelsey. Kelsey, this is your opportunity to really steal it completely. This is a symphony in Sydney, the Sydney Opera House. I love that guess. Nicole, this is your chance to tie it. I'm going to say we're in Vienna and we're listening to a Mozart concert in the place where he was born, but they're just warming up. Trying to get all those extra half points with in the place he was born. And they're just warming up. (laughs) Well, the answer is a sea organ. The sea organ in Zadar, Croatia is a unique musical instrument built into the city's coastal steps. It was designed by an architect and it uses the movement of the sea waves to push air through a series of pipes, creating natural and harmonious sounds. 
And the best part is you can hear that sound on our Winter in Croatia tour because we visit these sea organ stairs in Zadar, Croatia. That's so cool. Well, we do have a winner, and that winner is Kelsey. Kelsey with one point. But the best part is you are all winners because you've learned so much mm -hmm. from this trivia. I am shaking hands with you. Good game, Nicole. I, I yeah. do like being the host, but this is good. Now, it's time for our next segment, Destination Duel. In Ooh. this game, we pit our global knowledge against each other, and every round centers on a specific region or place. Today's Destination Duel is all about Scandinavia and the Nordic nations. There will be 10 questions in total, and each correct answer earns you one point. Listeners at home, feel free to keep track of your own score and see how you stack up against Josh and Nicole. So let's see who comes out on top as the ultimate expert on Scandinavia and the Nordic nations. Okay, put on your best Viking faces and let's duel. Bring it. Question number one. What is the name of the festival celebrated around summer solstice in Nordic countries known for its bonfires and midnight sun? Do we see the sun tour? This is hard. I'll tell you what. My hint is, oh, I'm too sweet. I'm not giving you hints. <laughs> no hints. Okay. Burning Love Festival. The Burning Love Festival. Summer Solstice Festival. The answer is Midsummer. I was waiting for that one because there was a movie Midsummer too, that was a horror movie. I literally said Summer Solstice. And then I said Midnight Sun. Midsummer, also known as Midsommar in Sweden, is celebrated with large bonfires, dancing around maypoles, and feasting on traditional foods like pickled herring, yum, and strawberries. Sounds in really some fun. parts of the Nordic countries, the sun never sets during this time, allowing for continuous celebrations under the midnight sun. Oh, this sounds super fun. I would it go. is. It is. I, I love would go too. Pickled herring. Was your hint going to mention Shakespeare? No, I was going to say, I literally just said both the words. Uh, the sentence. That would have been a good hint. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I was very close. It's zero, zero. Thanks for that. Question two. What is the name of the famous route in Iceland known for its natural scenic wonders, including Thinkfilir National Park and Gudfals Waterfall? The Golden Circle. The Golden Circle. Correct. The Golden Circle. <laughs> I hesitated because I was trying to figure out if you guys both get points or if it's like first one to answer. Thinking first. No, it's the, yeah. it's the first one to answer for this one. And that was me. Thank you. But I knew he was right, so I repeat. So the Golden Circle is a popular tourist route in Iceland that covers approximately 300 kilometers. That's about 185 miles if you don't want to convert. Uh, so in addition to Thinkflir National Park and Gutfalls Waterfall, it includes the geothermal area in Hakadulu. Um, it's home to the famous geyser and stroker geysers that erupt with boiling water every few minutes. Have either of you been to Iceland? I have. I went in 2015. See, I haven't been, so this is like an unfair advantage. I tour guided twice, so I was able to do the Golden Circle a couple of times. Yeah. I tour or at guide... least the Think Valier. I tour guided once, and it was by far the scariest thing I've ever done in my life. And I have jumped out of a plane. It so. was. I will agree with you. Okay, this one you don't have to have been there to know the answer. Ready? Where does the name IKEA come from? I've got four options for you. A, this Swedish word for meatball, because you can get meatballs there. B, a type of Swedish wood, because sometimes the furniture could be made out of Ikea wood. C, the initials of the founder and the farm and village where he grew up. Or D, the name of the founder's grandmother. So it's not first to answer. I will have each of you answer one after the other. I'm going to say C. So I have to pick a different one, even though I know the answer? No, you can pick the same one if you want to copy her. It's not copying, but I see the one with the, the family name, right? Igor's or Ivan's or what's his name? Well, you know a lot about IKEA. Is your answer C, Josh? C. C, as in cat? As in yes. Okay. And the answer is C, the initials of the founder and the farm and village where he grew up. So the name IKEA oh. is an acronym that stands for, you were very close, Josh, Ingvar Kamprod, which is the founder's name, Elmtard, which is the farm where he grew up, and a gun yard, which is his hometown in Sweden. It was founded in 1943. IKEA has grown from a small mail order business into the world's largest furniture retailer. Uh, I love Ikea. I used to, my whole oh. house was furnished by Ikea. Tyria. I was really hoping someone would say Swedish meatball. I thought I got you. I thought I got you on that one. Why would you name a furniture, like a place that has all sorts of house things after a meatball? It is good. 
Okay, question number four. Can you name the countries that are considered Scandinavian and those that are considered Nordic? List the correct nations in each group. Bzz. Josh. Okay, so Nordic countries are Sweden, Denmark, Finland, Norway, mm-hmm. Iceland. Correct. And which countries are Scandinavian countries? All of those except for Iceland. It's all of them except for two. Yeah. All of them except for Iceland and Finland. Correct. I feel like I may have spooned Did I her steal that? <laughs> Ooh, and Nicole comes. Yeah. Come for the you, steal. You, you, she couldn't steal it. You could get a point for half of it, but you couldn't steal it. I feel like you guys are against me. It's like you like to play trivia. You like me to host. And when I play, everyone's taking my points, even my half points. And I'm just here trying to Technically, you wouldn't even have gotten a half point there. You would have gotten a quarter of a point because I got Josh. Iceland. You would have only okay. have gotten Finland. So those of us who are confused at home, Scandinavian countries include Denmark, Norway, and Sweden. Nordic countries include Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Finland, and Iceland. So while all Scandinavian countries are Nordic, not all Nordic countries are Scandinavian. So the term Scandinavia specifically refers to the three countries of Denmark, Norway, and Sweden, which are linked by similar languages and cultural histories. The name comes from Scandia, a Latin term used by the Romans to refer to the region. These countries share Germanic roots and have historically been closely connected through various political unions and alliances. Did either of you know that I am Norwegian? That makes sense. You are like seven feet tall. Yes, I am Norwegian, and we moved to Minnesota. That's where a lot of Norwegians moved when they came to America. My husband's family is Swedish, and I can sing Happy Birthday completely in Swedish. Let's hear it. I'll give you one point. All right. Oh, my God. I'm so excited. Montana Leva, Montana Leva, Montana Leva, Hooty Hundra, yo. Yaviska Haliva, Yaviska Haliva, Yaviska Haliva, Hooty Hundra, yo. Venska Leva, hurrah, hurrah. That is it. Every Nicole. birthday we sing that. I'm sorry, but that was awesome. Thank you. Two points. Two okay, points okay. Nicole. Next next question. Oh, there's more. I have 10 questions, oh. <laughs> guys. This Icelandic dish known as Harkatol is made from a fermented what? First answer. Shark. Shark. It was me. I'm, he said it right after me. It was me, right? It was Nicole. I heard him after I heard me, but that's that's fine. So it's shark. I have had it. I did get a chance to eat it when I was me in too. Because you got it, right? You just got to be adventurous and eat the fermented stinky and shark. And n- never again. Never again. Never again. Me. Once was enough. So this traditional Icelandic dish made from fermented shark is notorious for its strong, pungent smell and acquired taste. The shark used typically Greenland shark is toxic when it's fresh. So it must undergo a lengthy fermentation process and several months of drying to be safe to eat. Like they literally just put it in a hole in the ground and let it sit there for months. Mm. And then they just bring it back up and they eat it. It's And it's a delicacy. Delicious. They love it. And then you have to chase it with a shot of what's that? Yeah, it was like a clear, yeah, clear drink. I won't lie, this isn't like getting me to be like, I gotta book a trip now. Like the way Yum. when you talk about food in Italy or something. The drink is a schnapps and it's called Brennevin. Brennevin. The, the Black Death. Oh. It's a clear and unsweetened Icelandic schnapps with 37.5% alcohol content. Very Maybe you scary. take a shot of that before the shark instead yeah. of after. Like, can you have some fermented shark that could be toxic if it's not prepared just so with your black death? Like, this sounds like a really, like... I mean, these people because are... Because these were the Vikings back in the day. Vikings. That's yeah. true. Yeah. Okay. You know what? I like that. Okay. Next question. Which country ranks first in the world for coffee consumption per capita? Denmark. Finland. Nicole gets that one. It is Finland. So Finland consumes 12 kilograms per person of coffee annually. That's over 26 and a half pounds if we're converting. Norway is second and consumes 9.9 kilos of coffee annually. And Nicole is third Coming in with 9.8 kilos of coffee annually that she's drinking. It's so true. I like to <laughs> do my part. Yeah. I've so never heard of that. It, you don't it's known coffee? as, let's see if I can get this one right, Kavi Tokoa. It's a cherished part of Finnish culture, and it's common for people to drink multiple cups throughout the day. So it is Finnish culture just to drink coffee all the time. Okay. What is the northernmost capital in the world? Uh... Reykjavik. 
Oslo. Reykjavik is the correct answer. Point goes to Josh. So the capital of Iceland is Reykjavik. It's the northernmost capital city in the world, located just south of the Arctic Circle. Reykjavik experiences unique phenomenon such as the midnight sun, remember number one's question, during the summer months and the northern lights <laughs> in the winter, offering a spectacular display of natural beauty. I love Reykjavik. And I like, what was that church called? It was like the Hoxgrimskirka, the big tall church I know, church you've in been the there. I haven't been. Is that the one that's all like, it looks very rippled? Yeah, it's like in Little Oregon looking. Josh, if you don't get this one, your title for whatever I'm going to say after this will be taken from you. Wow. Which Danish fairy tale author wrote famous stories such as The Little Mermaid and The Ugly Duckling? Hans Christian Andersen. Hans Christian Andersen. Ooh, that was great, guys. I'm so proud of both of you, but I heard Nicole first. Me too. Me too, Nicole heard Nicole <laughs> first. So Hans Christian Andersen, the renowned Danish fairy tale author, wrote over 160 fairy tales during his lifetime. The Little Mermaid, The Ugly Duckling, The Emperor's New Clothes, The Princess and the Pea, Thumbelina. I love Thumbelina. Me too. The Snow Queen, which actually inspired Disney's Frozen, The Nightingale, and The Red Shoes, which I have never heard of. Josh, you get to keep your fairy tale Disney expert card. Proud of you. you. Proud of you. Okay, here we go, Nicole. I'll give you one more to see if you can win. We would tie. Or tie. And then I have another one for that after. I came prepared. I am going to list four names, and you have to tell me what connects them. First to answer gets the point. Bjorn. Benny. Abba. I'm sorry. I'm obsessed with Ava. It's Ava. Those are the men. And then you're going to name the women. I can't remember their names, but I know that those are the men. And I know Ava. Josh? Abba. You get Josh? <laughs> he, he knows it's Ava. Has Josh yeah. left the chat? I'm still here. Oh. I'll let her have that. For those of us keeping score, it's four and a half to five and a half. Josh, you're one point down for all the cookies. What nation has won more medals in the Winter Olympics than any other? Sweden. Norway. Nicole, what'd you say? Sweden. The answer is, Josh, you got that point. It's Norway. Norway has won 368 medals to date since the first Winter Olympic Games were held in 1924. Okay. Go Norwegians. I'm Norwegian. Go us. So it's a tie. Five and a half to five and a half. Here's our an intense tie game. breaker. In which winter sport have Norway won more Olympic golds than any other country? Skiing. Bobsled. Hmm. I want to be petty. I want to be petty because I was going to get a point when I said monkey for Costa Rica and that sound. And I didn't get the point because I didn't say howler. Mm -hmm. And the answer is cross country skiing. Skiing. Just like I said. Nope. You said skiing. And they wouldn't give a medal just for skiing. They would give a medal for cross-country skiing, or they would mm -hmm. give a medal for downhill skiing, or they would give a medal for ski jumping. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Five and a half to five and a half. This is for all the cookies. Which Scandinavian city hosted the 1994 Winter Olympics? Lillehammer. Nancy Kerrigan? Like, Lillehammer. Josh? She's correct. I will let her have that, even though I knew it. Nicole wins it with yes. Lily Hammer. I'm so excited. I've never won before. Lily yet. Hammer Norway. That was the year of, just like she said, Tanya Harding and Nancy Kerrigan began their feud. So, Nicole. And we're going to let the listeners chime in to see who actually won. Oh, and the winner is me. me. I was the best host that there's been so far. <laughs> no, because I have yet to host, and here I go. Are you two ready to compete? Here we you guys go. have a lot of Kelsey practice and competing. Josh. Kelsey and Josh, welcome to our third and final round, which we call What in the World? We've gathered some of the most bizarre, interesting, and off-the-wall facts from around the globe, and now we're going to put them to you, Kelsey and Josh, to see if you can figure out the answers. No points. You guys are maybe not going to like this part. No points are awarded for this round because that would be cruel, but points may be awarded for creativity. This one is all about glory and bragging rights. Let's dive into the weird and wonderful world of what in the world. I'm so ready. I'm so weird. I've embraced it. You are. I she think she will probably win this one. Weird and wonderful. All right. Question one. I'll go to each of you for your answer. All right. Which country has a restaurant that serves a dish called fugu, a potentially deadly pufferfish 
that must be prepared by specially licensed chefs. Japan. Vietnam. And the win goes to Kelsey. Nice, Kelsey. Japan. Would you eat it? I couldn't. I'm adventurous, but like. <laughs> you wouldn't eat it. You would eat the shark that's toxic underground. Yeah, but, but it's not going to nah. kill me. But you say it's that one time. Like the shark, you said that was a one time thing. This wouldn't be a one time thing. What if it was a one time thing and a last time thing? A like specially licensed chef is the only one allowed to touch this thing. Exactly. That's scary. <laughs> what if he just got that license? I'm, I can't. <laughs> I can't. Well, fun fact, this puffer fish, this fugu, contains tetrodotoxin. This is not going to convince you to try this. A potent <laughs> neurotoxin that can be fatal if ingested. The preparation of fugu is highly regulated in Japan, requiring chefs to undergo rigorous training and certification. Despite the risks, fugu is considered a delicacy, and its nope. thrill-seeking diners often say the slight numbing sensation left on the lips <laughs> Adds to the experience. The fish is typically served as sashimi, hot pot, or fried. So <laughs> even when it doesn't kill you, it can make your lips numb. I think that would terrify me. All right. Can't do it either. And I think we're all in agreement on this. Okay. Question two. In Zagreb, Croatia, you can find a museum of broken what? Plates. Accordions. Remember the points for creativity, guys. I'm going to make each of you, you're both wrong. So just for fun, since neither of you will get the point, try again. Hearts. Broken hearts. Broken. He's like, accordions. That's <laughs> broken family. Wow. Broken families. I mean, that would be a really sad museum. It would be a sad museum. Actually, it is a sad museum. Kelsey's kind of close with the broken hearts. The answer is the Museum of Broken Relationships, where people can donate objects from their failed romances. Do I get a point for that? I don't know. It's broken relationships. You said broken hearts. I mean, but there's no point. What do you get there's no when you get points. a broken relationship? A broken heart. I don't know. The Museum of Broken Relationships. What if your relationship is a family and you had a broken family? <laughs> What's... I feel like families is closer to relationships than Remember, hearts. guys, there's no points. It showcases donated points. items from failed romances, each accompanied by a personal story. This unique museum offers a poignant and sometimes humorous look at the end of relationships, featuring items like love letters, wedding dresses, and even an axe used to chop up a former lover's furniture. It has inspired similar exhibitions in other cities around the world. I meant to ask for that back. <laughs> the axe. That's terrifying. All right, you guys ready for question three? What in the world? In Gloucestershire, England, each year on the spring bank holiday, you can participate in an annual competition of chasing what down a very steep hill? An oiled pig. I feel like that's the answer. Oh, Josh, you got to give us something. <laughs> Chasing wild geese. It almost rhymes with geese. It's cheese. You chase oh. cheese? Cheese. You chase cheese? Yes. Yeah, so the annual cheese rolling competition at Cooper's Hill in Gloucestershire, England, features participants chasing a wheel of double Gloucester cheese down a steep 200-yard hill. Known for its thrills and spills, this quirky event draws daredevils from around the world who race down the hill, often taking spectacular tumbles in pursuit of the rolling cheese. <laughs> I want to participate in that. Yeah, my love for cheese. I throw myself down a hill after it, too. I agree. Let's, let's do it, Kelsey, let's go. Let's do it. Despite the risks, this tradition dates back to at least 1826. They know what they're doing. All right. Question four. In Norway, let's put our Norway hats back on, there is a town called what, and every year it freezes over. Hell. <laughs> I can't Kelsey? think of anything but hell. Can you read the question over again? In Norway, there is a town called what, and every year it freezes over. Fish. Goes to Josh, it's hell. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> yep, the town of hell located in Throndelag county of Norway experiences subarctic temperatures that can drop as low as negative 25 Celsius or negative 13 degrees Fahrenheit during the winter months. This small village, which has a population of around 1,500 people, has become a quirky tourist attraction largely because of its name. Visitors often take photos in front of the Hell train station sign. Interestingly, the name Hell comes from the old Norse word helir, which means overhang or cliff cave, and in modern Norwegian it means luck. Okay. Yeah. All right. Question five, and this is our final question. Are you guys ready? What's this? This There's was a no point. No scores. points. There's always points. Okay, then. Uh, it's tied, guys. Okay. okay. It's tied. So last question. Let's break this tie. Question five. Okunoshima <laughs> is a Japanese island that is overrun by friendly what? Oiled guinea pigs. pigs. What is with the oiled pigs? It, it has to be oh, no. right eventually. 
Rabbits. Okunoshima, also known as Rabbit Island, is located in the Sito Inland Sea in Hiroshima Prefecture, Japan. The island is famous for its large population of friendly rabbits, which roam freely and are accustomed to human interaction. I love that so much. I know. That sounds so adorable. This unique attraction has made a popular destination for tourists who can feed and cuddle with the bunnies. Oh, my gosh. I want to go. I want to go cuddle with the bunnies. The current Um, rabbit population is believed to have originated from a small group of eight rabbits released by school children in 1971. With no natural predators on the island, the rabbit population quickly grew, creating the bunny haven seen today. What a nice way to end trivia. Bunnies. Love it. Did I win? No. I think that one ended on a tie. Remember, you guys got the bragging rights for that one. But I also won against Nicole. Mm. So am I the reigning champion of today's episode? Sure. Thanks. I needed that. (laughs) Josh usually beats me. You can only stay humble for so long, you know? It's okay. Once our listeners let us know that I actually won against Nicole, I will be the reigning champion. Send in your thoughts at travelunpacked at colette.com. I won. On who won. Skiing is skiing. Well, I loved it. I love a good trivia. Now that we kind of know what we're up against with sounds, oiled pigs, you know, it's going to be a fun time doing trivia in the future. It was hard. It was really hard. I'm glad I didn't have to do that. Thank you. It was really hard, Josh. You guys, does the Vatican even have church bells? I don't know, but I just remember constantly being in the right country, like near the right answer all the time on most of the questions. You know what they say about almost, Nicole, only? Practically. Horseshoes and hand grenades. That's it. So this was a really fun episode. I was excited that I got to play trivia for once because usually I kind of harness the competitiveness of my co-host here. But this was really fun. In the first round, Kelsey won. And then in the second round, Josh and I went toe-to-toe on Nordic Scandinavian trivia. And I won in a sort of disputed turn of events. Highly disputed. Skiing is skiing, but listeners, feel free to weigh in. And in our final round, Kelsey versus Josh, nobody won. It was just for fun, but they think they tied. And we're going to, if you see them in the hallway or out in the world, just say, good job. You did really good on that one. So it was fun. Thank you for playing with us, listeners. Thank you. Thank you, listeners. Ciao. Until next time. Enjoy old pigs. (laughs) Bye.